Today, we are going to study the detailed physics of Ed Leeds Scownen's perpetual motion holder, or PMH, which just still remains a mystery after 80 years. And today, I'm going to explain it in terms of simple classical physics. Although it hasn't been known before, you need a DC power supply here, sit at 12 volts, it'll go to 5 amps when I turn it on. Have a little on-off switch here. Those connect to a U-shaped iron or steel bar with two electromagnets placed over it. In this case, I've got the north poles of the electromagnet and the south poles parallel with one another. And you put a little square bar here made of mild steel. And these surfaces have to fit quite nicely. Now when I flip the switch over here to turn it on, as expected, 5 amps, switch on, the metal steel bar will hold quite strongly, I turn it off, and the steel bar falls off again. That's a standard lift magnet. Now let's see what Ed Leeds Scoundrel discovered. Ed Leeds Scoundrel discovered that if you take these two electromagnets and turn them in opposite directions, north here, south here, north here, south here, and turn the power on again, the switch, again it clicks, 5 amps, switch on, but now when we turn the power off again, there's no power, the metal bar won't come loose, it stays stuck. And we have to use quite a lot of power to pull it off again. Let's do it at 20 volts. 24 volts, 10 amps, just to show how strong it can be. We can also do the same experiment at 24 volts and 10 amps by flipping the switch, and then we get really strong attraction. Flip the switch, 9 amps, turn it off again, come over here, no power going to the electromagnets, and it's stuck on very strongly, although no power is going through. The electromagnets <clears throat> got it loose. So that's interesting. Why does that happen? As a third variation of this experiment, we can take one of the electromagnets off completely, put it over here, leave the other one on the U-shaped bar. This is a space. And now when we turn on 12 volts and 5 amps, it sticks. And we turn off the power. And does it stick or not stick? It still sticks, just with one electromagnet. The other one's over here. How does that happen? Let's pull it loose. <clears throat> now we can explain how this works quite easily in terms of the classical magnetic field. But first, we have to learn something about how the field flows in a magnet and not just the north and south poles. This is a very good teaching exercise for undergraduate students. So I've put the tools out so that an undergraduate teacher of physics may wish to reproduce the same experiments and give his students something very insightful to do. If we have, say, a bar magnet of north and south poles here, you'll read a north-south here, north-south here, but you'll read south-north on both sides because of the way the field flows around like that, upside down. Similarly, for an electromagnet made of wire coils north and south, you read north-south here, north-south here, but on both sides you read south-north because it flows around like that. Now just to explain these concepts more clearly, I've made a little physical model for teaching purposes. I've taken a neodymium magnet 20 millimeters times 5 millimeters thick, I put two steel bars on either side, I put tape red and blue for the north and south poles. As we put a compass nearby, we can see the top end of the compass, the north poles clearly up above that part of the magnet. Come down here, the north pole is still clearly up along the bottom end of the magnet, but on each side the north pole is reversed pointing downward. And that's just what we saw in our little drawing here. North, north, south, south. And let's emphasize that to go from the north pole down to the south is 360 degrees of rotation of the compass. To go from the south hole back up to the north is another 360 degrees of rotation of the compass. Two full turns. This concept is essential in trying to understand Edley Scalman's PMH.
In order to understand Ed's PMH, let's look at the first example where the two electromagnets are lined in the same way. So we have an iron bar, we should have NS here at the tops, two SNs on each side, and two NSs at the bottom. Let's confirm that with a compass. We're only going to use 4 volts, 1.6 amps, for safety while I get around it. So we go over here, and we have the north poles down on that side, down on that side, up on the bottom, up on the bottom, just like we expect. It's exactly the same as here. North poles, south poles, north poles. Now, this will get, make this square piece of steel stick temporarily. When I turn the power off, it falls off. Turn the power on again, and it sticks again. So what's happening here is we're getting induced north-south paramagnetic domains in this square iron bar here and here, as shown there and there. The north poles here and here induce north-south paramagnetic domains here and here, but these don't interact with one another at all. If anything, they repel. So we only get temporary lift at 12 volts, 5 amps, whatever. The lift isn't permanent, and these sticking attachments, as soon as we turn the power off, everything falls apart. Let's look now when the electromagnets are reversed. Next, when the electromagnets are reversed, like this, we would expect to see south-north on that side, north-south on the other side, and that's what we do see. South-north on that side, north-south on the other side of the coil. And below, we'd expect to see north-south there, but south-north there. And then we do see north-south there, but south-north there. So when we put a bar up, it sticks permanently because these two domains, the north-south and the south-north, are attracting one another interactively by the flow. The flow of magnetism goes all the way around the magnet, up through here, all around the steel bar, down through here and around. We've got a circular flow of magnetic potential all the way around once the coils are reversed. We turn it off, the circular flow remains stable, going all the way around the U-shape and through the bar until we put some power on it. Ah, now it comes off and now the effect is lost. Finally, let's examine how the third of Ed Leeds Gowden's models works with just one electromagnet. Now we have one electromagnet, we'll have north-south, south-north, north-south, and we'll have a north-south domain here. There's no electromagnet on the other side. However, this south-north flow of electrons, flow of virtual magnetic particles to be more precise, covers that whole side of the bar through space and makes a south domain over there. And so it works sort of like the two electromagnets, but more weakly. Let's put the compass up to confirm. We have south-north here and north-south here. South-north here and north-south here. On the other side, we still have south-north right where the electromagnet would be. And also we have south-north down here. So we still get two domains, north-south, north-south of opposite values. And the bar sticks. We turn off the power, the bar is still sticking. We're still getting that flow here without having a second electromagnet. North-south here, south-north there. Now here's an interesting effect. If we start from Ed Leeds Gownan's PMH with two electromagnets arranged in opposite directions on a U-shaped bar of steel and put another little bar of, of iron or steel below with a wire coil on it and we haven't connected the leads yet and we put 30 volts into it DC and turn on the power it won't jump until we get very close let's get very close to the U-shaped iron bar next if we attach the leads from that third wire coil to the main power supply at 30 volts DC and turn on the power of the pulse the iron bar will jump to the PMH even some distance away that same distance when leads to the wire coil are not attached and we turn on the 30 volts nothing happens and when we attach leads from that third wire coil to the main power supply and turn it on again at 30 volts 
it jumped from some distance away. Thus, in principle, this long distance jumping mechanism, over 10 centimeters, maybe even over a foot, could be used to lift heavy rocks. If this was placed at the top of a tripod, this slightly below in the rock here, when you turn on the DC power as a pulse, the rock would go up one foot, you tighten the chain, you'd loosen it again, drop the crossbar, lift another foot, loosen the chain, drop the crossbar, lift the rock another foot, and so on. Each DC pulse could lift the rock by, say, even 30-ton rock by increments of, say, one foot. Is that how Ed Leach Scownan did it? The pull distance for this device seems proportional to how many amps I get coming out of my power supply. This particular power supply at 30 volts will go to about 10 amps. And when I turn it on, it'll go about 6 centimeter to close and pull. So I measured DC volts, DC amps, and the distance. And you see that particular power supply only goes to 10 amps and I can only get it to pull about six centimeter. Here's another power supply which is going to 15 volts at about 12 amps. And when I turn that on, you can see it's again about six centimeter. In order to get more power out of this, we have to use car batteries at 12 volts and lots more amps to create much stronger magnetic fields. And that's what Ed Lee Scownan did using banks of many car batteries lined up in a row. He could have put hundreds of amps into this thing.